we'll look into the design philosophies in this video. Most of the modern design codes adopt what we call as the limit state design philosophy. In the limit state design philosophy, the designers fix the certain boundary conditions for the structure and the designer ensures that the structure performs within that boundary conditions and the, and the designers will take safety factors and safety measures to ensure that these criteria are met. Australian standards also use the limit state design philosophy. In the limit state design philosophy, the boundary conditions that we set for the structures are called as limit states. Limit states are basically the, the boundaries made for the structure so that the structure within that boundaries can perform its desired functions. And when the structure goes beyond that boundary, boundary conditions, they become unfit for its intended purpose and it can fail it can collapse or it can have excessive deflections, cracks, so that it is unfit for its intended purpose. There are three limit states defined for structuring structures. The first one is called as ultimate limit state. The second one is called as serviceability limit state. And the final one, depending on the structures, are called as special limit states. And we'll go through each one of them now. The ultimate limit state, as the name suggests, is about ultimate performance of the structure from the strength perspective. When the, when the structure re reaches or exceeds the ultimate limit state, the structure or the part of the structure may collapse or fail. Since the ultimate limit state is about the structural integrity of the structure itself, and it can lead to the loss of life or significant financial loss. When we are designing the structure, we have to ensure that there is a very small probability that the structure will lead, reach the ultimate limit state. Some of the kinds of ultimate limit state are loss of equilibrium, for example. For example, if it is a retaining wall, Um, supporting the art field here. The ultimate limit state for the retaining wall can be the collapse or um, loss of equilibrium of the retaining wall. Whereas for a structural beam or column, the ultimate limit state can be rupture or the loss of strength and the structural member can fail in flexure, shear, axial or torsional failures. And also progressive failure is another kind of major limit state where failure of one member passes the load to the another member where it will subsequently fail and leads, uh, leads to the progressive failure or collapse of the whole structure. And also the formation of the plastic hinge making it the structure unstable also is an example of an ultimate limit state. Or a fatigue failure of a structure is also an example of ultimate limit state. Whereas the serviceability limit states involves the disruption of the day-to-day -day function of the structure itself. It may not compromise the structural integrity, but when the structure exceeds the serviceability limit state, the occupants may feel discomfort or it can have aesthetic issues for the structure. So as the serviceability limit state has less danger for loss of, li of loss, loss of life, we can have bigger tolerance for, for its probability of occurrence. The major serviceable limit state that we have to consider in structural designs are excessive deflection, limiting the excessive deflection, excessive crack weights, and undesirable vibrations as well. So these are the serviceable limit state we have to design the structure for. Now, if you look into um, the load displacement curve for a structure, now what it means is that um, if the structure is subjected to a load, it will initially behave elastically, as you can see here. And at certain point, the structure might crack. There might have uh, developed some cracking in the structure. That's where the structure will start to be behave non-linearly. And at certain point, the structure will start to yield. And finally, it will reach its ultimate capacity here and it will fail at certain point. 
Now, if you look into this uh, uh, load displacement curve for structure, the ultimate limit state is around this area when the structure is failing. So if the structure exceeds the ultimate limit state, the structure will fail. And as I said before, it, as it, it deals with the structure integrity and loss of life and significant financial loss, we have to make sure that the probability of occurrence of ultimate limit state is very small. Whereas the serviceability limit state is before the yielding of the member, that is during the day-to-day -day use of the member, the structure is not yielding. So this is the day-to-day -day using uh, limit, limit of the structure and that's where the serviceable limit state is. So for the day-to-day -day loading, the structure has to satisfy the serviceable limit state and for the ultimate loading, the structure has to satisfy the ultimate limit state. And depending on the structures, we can have some other lim special limit states. For example, uh, the performance of the structure in earthquake or fire or uh, structural effect of corrosions or long-term physical and chemical stability of the structures. So depending on the structure, they, might, they can have this kind of special limit states defined for them as well. Now, the design process is that uh, we first assume the design conditions um, depending on the type of the structure that we are designing for and then we take the structural type uh, we define the material properties and the construction methods as well so we will define all of these and then what we do the next step is that with all this information we check first ultimate limit state of the structure does it satisfy all the ultimate limit state Second, we check if it satisfies all the serviceability limit state relevant to the structure. And then if there are any other special limit states, we have to check as well. So we verify that if these limit states are satisfied. If they are satisfied, your design is safe. And uh, we, we can use the structural type design uh, accordingly. But if these limit states are not satisfied, we have to go back and either change the material, change the size of the cross section, or change the design method or the construction method as well. So, so we have to go through this process until we meet the ultimate limit state, serviceable limit state, and other limit state that are defined for that structure. The limit state design philosophy is more modern design philosophy. A long time back when the structures were built, they kind of used the trial and error method. That means they build the structure. If they are strong enough to carry the load, the structure will be fine otherwise the structure will fail that's the trial and error method and of course this is not a very scientific method and it's not very economically economically sustainable as well so after the trial and error method the scientists uh, the engineers started to use working stress method in the working stress method the adequacy of the structure is checked by calculating the st elastic stresses that are happening in the structure due to the expected loading due to the maximum expected loading on the structure and we ensure that the elastic stresses developed in the structures are within the allowable stress for the for the material we calculate the elastic stresses in in the structure member for all the loads like uh, for all the different loads from i equals to one to k so there can be different kinds of load like dead load live load so we calculate all the elastic stresses because of different loads and the summation of that should be sm smaller than or equal to the allowable stress or allowable strength of the material now the allowable strength of the material fa is calculated as the the strength or the ultimate stress in strength of the material divided by the safety factor gamma as you can draw here right so we first find out what is the allowable stress or allowable strength of the material by dividing the ultimate strength by the safety factor where gamma is known as the safety factor here and f naught here is the ultimate strength of the material So 
dividing the ultimate strength of the material with the safety factor, we get allowable allowable stress in that material. Now, the working stress design method is that we design the structure in such a way that the summation of all the stresses caused by the loads should be less than or equal to the allowable stress in the material. That means the structure will be safe in that case. However, one of the biggest assumptions in the working stress design method is that we assume that the structure will behave within the elastic limit. And that's the limitation of working stress method. Therefore, the working stress methods have some serious drawbacks. So first one, as we mentioned before, it only consider the elastic behavior of the material. For example, if we are looking at the concrete structure, so as we defined earlier, there will be elastic behavior, the structure will yield some point and finally fail. But with this working stress design method, we assume that the, the load condition is within the elastic limit only. It, the member hasn't yielded yet. So we want to make sure that all the stresses in the member is within that limit only. So the working stress method does not take into account the ultimate capacities of the member. So it doesn't go into that ultimate capacity range. So it is more conservative and it cannot use the material to its extreme capacities. We, we just want to make sure that the stresses in the, work, uh, in the material are within the elastic limit. Same in the steel as well. So in the steel case also, we want to make sure that the member behave within this elastic limit. So the biggest drawback of the working stress method is that it doesn't take into account the nonlinear behavior of the material and it is more conservative. And also we saw that in the working stress design method, all of the uncertainties are incorporated into just one safety factor, right? So as you saw earlier, the, when we calculate the allowable stress in the material, we divided the ultimate strength by the safety factor. That means all of the uncertainties that can go into the structural design, for example, uncertainty uncertainties in material properties, design methods, your calculation assumptions, um, the differences in the loads, all of that are incorporated into just one safety factor here. The modern design codes, however, uses the ultimate strain design method. In this ultimate strain design method, it follows the limit state design philosophy. Then, as I said before, in the limit state design method, we define the limits or the limit states for the structure to behave within. So for the ultimate strain design method, the structure are designed taking the ultimate strength of the material when the ultimate load condition is acting on it. And in the ultimate strain design method, we take the service loads, that means the day-to-day -day loading on the structure, and we multiply it with the load factors, which are greater than one, to simulate the extreme ultimate load condition that the structure can be subjected to. So we take the day-to-day -day loading and multiply with a factor which is greater than one to simulate the extreme loading conditions that the structure can be subjected to, to make sure that the structure can behave within the ultimate limit state. Secondly, we take the capacity of the member, we take the structure capacity of the member and then multiply it with the strain reduction factor or it is also called as capacity factor and this re strain reduction factor is less than one. So the aim of the strain reduction factor is to reduce the capacity of the member taking into account that there can be uncertainties in the materials, there can be uncertainties in the construction process or there can be assumption taken into account when designing the structure. So to take all that uncertainties in the design phase of the material, we take the strength reduction factor and multiply it, multiply the design capacity with multiply the ultimate capacity with it to calculate the design strength. So basically in the ultimate strength design method we have two safety factors here. First we are increasing load to the extreme limit to take into account all the uncertainty in the load that can act on the structure to, to simulate the extreme loading condition. And secondly, we take the strength reduction factor and we reduce the capacity of the member to take into account that there can be uncertainties in the material types used in the construction. There can be some assumption that may not be 
100% correct, there can be some defect in the construction method. To take that uncertainties into account, we multiply the strength of the material using the strength reduction factor. This ultimate design method is also called as load and resistant factor design or LFRD. The design formula for the ultimate strain design method is we have the ultimate capacity of a member, say a beam, then we multiply it with the strength reduction factor to take into account all the uncertainties in the material or design process or the assumptions gone into the design process. We then have the ultimate load scenario. We calculate it by using the serviceable load and multiplying it with the load factor. Then to ensure that the structure is within the ultimate limit state, the design capacity should be greater than or equal to the design load actions, that is H star. So this is the main equation for ultimate strain design method. It can also be written as RD, where R, RD stands for the design strength, which should be greater than or equal to ED, that is the design action effects using the load factors. So these equations represent the ultimate strain design method. In this equation, again, S star or ED stands for the design action effects of the member for the force by, and we, we obtain the design action effect by multiplying the serviceable load, like the dead load or the live load using the load factors. So here, both of these are the load factors. to simulate the extreme loading conditions. And load factors are greater than one. And phi here is a strain reduction factor or the capacity factor is less than one. Um, and phi RU or RD is the design strain capacity. And RU here is the nominal strength or the ultimate capacity obtained from the analysis itself. So basically the equation of the ultimate strain design method shows that the the design capacity of the member should be greater than or equal to the load action effect taking into account the extreme loading conditions. As we stated earlier, in the ultimate strain design method we use two kinds of safety factor. The first one is what we call as a load factor. In the load factor is taken into account to simulate the extreme loading conditions and we also take into account that more than one type of load might be acting on the structure at the time, right? So it can be the dead load and the live load acting at the same time. What we do is we use the load factors to simulate the extreme loading conditions and we use the load combination to take into account that multiple loads can be acting at the same time. For example, if the, only the dead load is acting, we will multiply the dead load using the load factor. This is the load factor. So we are multiplying the dead load with the load factor here. So we will calculate what is the load from this um, combination and also we will calculate what is the load from if the dead load and live load is acting together. Now if the dead load and live load is acting together, there uh, we, we will be using a smaller load factor as you can see here, 1.2G plus now we have the live, factor, uh, live load factor as well, 1.5Q and we'll find out what is the load action effect from there. And whichever is the extreme, that's the one that you use to find the bending moment and the shear forces. Now if you have earthquake loading or the wind loading, you will have to take that into account as well. Now, as you can see here, uh, when the wind load is acting on there, so we have a combination factor, xi c taken into account here. That is in there because when the wind load is acting and the dead load and live load, all of them are there, it is a bit unlikely that all of them will be at the maximum limit at the same time. So to take that into account, we take the xi c factor as a combination factor to take into account that the wind load, the dead load and the live load may not be at the extreme level at the same time. So Jai C is less than one here. And same as with the Jai E as well, when the earthquake load, the live load and the dead loads are also acting, it may not be at the extreme point at the same time as well. Now similar load factors are taken into account in other design codes as well. For example, in the European design code, as you can see, the, the design action effects are denoted as SD and 
for the dead load and live load, as you can see, the load factors are 1.35 G plus 1.5 Q. Similarly, in the American design code, um, they use the load factors, as you can see here. D stands for the dead load, L stands for the live load, and there are uh, load factors used for both the dead load and live load, and similarly for the wind and earthquake loads as well. Now, the second kind of safety factor that we use in the ultimate strain design method is strength reduction factor or capacity factor. We use the strength reduction factor to reduce the strength that we calculate for the member. So from the calculation, we get the ultimate strength capacity of a member. Then we use strength reduction factor to multiply to this ultimate capacity to reduce its capacity to, to take into account that the material that we use in the calculation may not be exactly the same as what is used in the construction site. It may have some defects. The material might have some defect or may not be exactly the same. Similarly, the, the design drawings that the designer provided may not be exactly rep replicated at the site. So there might be some defects in there as well. And also we use lots of assumption in the design process. And to take that assumption also into account, we use this trend reduction factor. So phi factor takes into account the uncertainties in the material, design process, construction methods, and all these uncertainties is built into the strength reduction factor. So what we are trying to do is, we are trying to increase the load to its extreme limit to simulate the extreme load condition. And then we are trying to reduce the strength of the member. So to in take into account all the uncertainties that can go in the construction process. And then we, we want to ensure that even with that reduction, the structure member capacity, the design capacity is still greater than the actions caused by the, the extreme loading conditions. Australian design standards give you this strength reduction fa factors for different materials. For example, for uh, steel structures, AS4100 is the one that we use for the steel structure, and AS1720 we use is for the timber structure. They give you the strength reduction factor factors for the steel and timber. Let's have a look at it. Now, for steel structure, AS4100, phi, the strength reduction factor for different members, as you can see here, are given here. Now, steel members as a whole, we use phi as 0 0.9. If it is connection, bolted connection, we use 0 0.8. And if it is a ply and bearing, as you can see, the strength reduction factor changes as well. So the strength reduction factor depends on um, the nature of the material as well. So if the material has higher um, confidence level, then the phi factor is higher as well. And as you know, the steel is a homogeneous material with the uniform properties. And most of the structural mem steel members are fabricated at the factory where the quality control is more uh, reliable. Uh, that means we can have a higher tolerance level. So the strength reduction fi factor is 0.9 here. So we, are, we have a, quite a confidence in steel. On the other hand, concrete is a non-homogeneous material. We mix sand, stone, water, and cement to make concrete. So there are so many different materials that goes into concrete, and there are so many things that can go wrong with that. So the phi factor, the strength reduction factor for concrete is smaller than steel because the confidence level in steel that we have is bigger than what we have for concrete. And also the concrete is cast in sight as well, so it's many things can go wrong there as well. So to take that into account, steel has a higher strain reduction factor, 0.9. Now, for this timber here, as you can see, the strain reduction factor varies quite a lot here as well. So it varies from 0.95 to 0.6, depending on the type of the timber, type of the structure that you are building, the condition where you are building as well. So the ultimate design equation here is presented in a more deterministic way, but the load factor that is j and the capacity factor of phi are de determined using a probabilistic model. The uncertainties are taken into account in a prob probabilistic way. The load factor z is defined using the probabilistic method. For example, in an office building, for the floor area, the load distributed over the floor area, say the mean amount is say 0 0.6 kilonewton per meter square. So that's the mean one, most probable one. Uh, that's the load acting on the given floor area for the office. Now, 
there can be some extreme loading conditions as well where the load in the office area can be go as big as say 2.1 kilonewton per meter square as well so this is the extreme loading condition this is your uh, mean loading conditions now when designing what we do is we don't use the mean loading condition because it will be too unsafe and we don't also use the maximum loading condition this one as it will be far too expensive to design for the very very unlikely amount of load that can be acting on the member so what we do is we use the nominal load somewhere here for the design process so we take into account that there we, there can be a variability in the load and the load will be more than the mean load that we are designing for this is the nominal load we will use for the for for our calculation and to take into account that there can be some extreme conditions here we multiply this one with the load factor to get the design load similarly the strength reduction factor phi is also found out using the probabilistic method as well say for example if we um, if we test hundreds of timber specimens for flexure uh, and plot the values um, we will see that the the material strength of the timber will 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 be plotted in a normal distribution curve like this one and we see that uh, the mean value of this timber strength is somewhere here it will be quite risky to design your timber member using this mean value isn't it because your members half of them have less strength than that mean value now if you use um, the extreme strength like this one of course it will be very very risky because only few of the members have that strength right but what we do is we instead of designing the mean value or the maximum value or the minimum value we will we'll design it for the nominal capacity f f dash and to take into account that there can be some defects in the timber there can be some material variations and properties differences in properties we multiply this nominal capacity with the five factors to take the material uncertainties and design uncertainties into it so for the, our design process we'll be using phi f dash instead of using the mean value or the maximum value or the minimum value so this is how the probabilistic design approach is taken into account for calculation of the strain reduction factor and the load factors. Now when we plot both the load effect and the capacity curve on the same plot here as you can see this is the load curve this is your nominal load effects on the structure from the load then we multiply with the xi factor to get the design load effect similarly in the capacity curve this one we have the nominal capacity somewhere here and then we multiply it with the phi factor to get the uh, design capacity and when the design capacity is greater than the design load your structure is safe but in this shaded area your design load is greater than your design capacity so the structure will be failing when whenever it is performing in this range the structure will fail because the design load is greater than the design capacity so to design the structure elements we have to understand what we call as a load path how the load is transferring from the slab up to the foundation we have to understand the load path so as you can see here these are the different elements in a typical steel structure we have here the metal decks or the slab system that supports the floor loading and these are the joists that support the floor deck so these joists are supporting the floor deck as you can see and then these girders support the joist and these columns are taking the load from the girders and then transferring to the foundation now when we are designing these um, girders or joists first we have to understand how the load is being transferred to the joist from the floor slab so as you can see this particular uh, joist here this is the joist if we have to design so it is carrying the load from the slab of that area right there are other joists here so this part of the load is going to this joist but this 
area but the load from this floor is going to the joist this particular joist here so uh, if you look at the 2d figure here so this is your joist so the load from the slab half of the slab from either side is going to that joist now as you can see the load path now as you can see here so this particular beam or joist is taking the floor load half of this floor load is taken by this particular joist here good and um, if I change the color and this joist will take this half of the load this joist good and similarly other joists will be sharing the load as well and the final joist here will be taking this half of the load will be taken by this one good and that load will be transferred to this girder here and the girder is taking the load from the joist so it is a pretty much the point load transferring to the girder um, so if you draw the girder here so if we, this is your girder so all of these joists are transferring the point load onto the girder like this one right and the girder is supported by the column say and then the load is being transferred to the uh, column through the girder so first the load from the floor is transferred to the beam or the joist here and then that load is transferred to the girder each, each joist is transferring the load to the girder and then the girder will transfer the load to each one of the column there so this is the load path that you have to understand as you will uh, to design each of the structure elements